coming up on Doctype, we'll show you two completely different ways to create mockups. Then, we continue our tutorial on the crazy canvas tag. So grab your digitizer tablet and a coffee cup full of candy because it's time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is brought to you by Think Vitamin Memberships and GoDaddy. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that thinks JavaScript is a decaf latte, or a developer who can't tell his margin from his padding, Doctype has the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you the emperor of the interwebs. Alrighty. So, as we mentioned last episode, this episode, or after this episode, I'm getting really confused here, we're going to be taking a short couple week hiatus. Yeah, we'll be back in September and really the point is that we want to step back and sort of take a look at Doctype and figure out ways we can make it even awesomer. So if you follow us at Doctype TV on Twitter and check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Doctype, you'll be able to keep up with all the latest Doctype news. And more importantly, you'll be able to tell us what you like and what you think we could improve about Doctype. This really all starts from you, and we're listening, and we want to know what we can do to make Doctype even better. Heck yeah. All right, this week, I'm going to be talking about wireframing and mockups. I'm doing part two of our Canvas tutorial. Let's check it out. There's a lot of debate in the design community about high fidelity mockups versus low fidelity mockups. In this episode, I'm going to show you two contradictory viewpoints. Some designers like to make hi-fi mockups that look exactly like the final site design. And there are many advantages to this. For one, you know exactly what the final site should look like before you even get started. Two, it's sometimes easier to see the interactions between various design details. And lastly, it's easy to show off your idea to others. In some situations, it's best to make a high fidelity mockup for business purposes. One of your clients or the company you work for might prefer to give final approval on a design before it's actually turned into HTML and CSS. High fidelity designs also provide you with many of the image assets that you'll need when constructing the final site. You would have to make these images anyway, so why not just make them during the mockup stage? Now that we've seen the advantages of high fidelity mockups, let's take a look at the other end of the spectrum. Low fidelity mockups can be created with wireframing tools like Balsamic, Mockingbird, or better yet, just a pen and paper. In fact, some designers like to use a large permanent marker instead of a pen because it naturally forces you to draw at a lower resolution with less detail. Lo-fi mockups also allow you to iterate on a design much faster and get straight into HTML and CSS. This can be hugely advantageous in many situations, especially in agile workflows. High fidelity mockups done in Photoshop can be slow to create, and they can oftentimes prevent you from working on interactivity and the flow of interaction. With lo-fi mockups, you get to the code faster so that you can model the functionality and you leave the details for last. So what's the verdict? Should you go with high fidelity or low fidelity mockups? The truth is, it depends on your situation and what you're comfortable with. If you need to show clients and your team lots of detail early on, a hi-fi mockup might be best. If you're more concerned about functionality and flexibility, then break out the paper and markers. Don't close that browser tab because when we come back, Jim is going to show you more about the canvas tag. Think Vitamin Membership is the place to learn about the web. When you become a member, you get unlimited access to a huge library of in-depth tutorial videos that covers CSS3, HTML5, jQuery, UX, and more. And if that's not enough, two new videos are added every day, so you'll always be up to date with the latest design techniques and web technology. You also get tickets to amazing online conferences that cover topics like the business of web design, iPhone app development, and web typography. You can watch live and ask questions to the speakers, and you can always rewatch them later. Check it out at membership.thinkvitamin.com. It's all the training you'll ever need for less than a dollar a day. Last week, we showed you how to draw simple rectangles using the canvas. This week, we're going to draw some more complex shapes. Drawing rectangles with the canvas is very easy, but we can draw more complex shapes using paths. Drawing paths is kind of like drawing with a pen. You can draw paths from point to point, 
and pick up your pen and move it to another point. The first thing we want to do is call begin path on our canvas's context object. This means that this is the beginning of our path, and any strokes or fill that we apply in the future will only be applied to the instructions called after the begin path call. The first thing we want to do is call move to and pass it an X and Y. This is like picking up your pen and placing it somewhere on the paper. Then you can call line two and extend your path from the current position to a new position. Now this doesn't actually put pixels on the canvas, but creates a path that you can stroke and or fill later. If we do another line two to another point, our path will now consist of two line segments. Now to make this a closed shape, we could either make our next line two calls destination, the same as the origin of our first call, but we can use the special close path function, which will create a line to the first point in our path set. Now we can use the stroke method to apply a stroke to our path, and it'll use the most recent stroke style. We could also apply a fill by calling fill. Now if we had not closed our shape, our fill would look the same. Filling an unclosed shape will fill the area of the shape that would have been filled had you called close path. But if we stroke it, however, we can see that the shape is not truly closed. We can draw circles or arcs on the canvas using the arc method. Arc can be a little confusing to begin with, but once you get the hang of it, you can make some pretty cool shapes. Your geometry and trigonometry classes can finally be put to use when working with arcs and lines in the canvas. The arc method looks like this, with an x, a y, radius, start angle, end angle, and anti-clockwise argument. So imagine we want to draw a circle. First, we choose the center of our circle. Let's say in our case 200 and 150, or the center of our canvas. We need to then determine the radius. I want my circle to be 200 wide, so the radius is going to be half that at 100. Next, we need to choose what part of the imaginary circle defined by x, y, and radius we want to draw. Now, since we're drawing a full circle, the start angle and the end angle are going to be at the same point, but 360 degrees apart. The angles, though, are measured in radians. If you're paying attention in trig, you'll remember that a full circle is 2 times pi radians. So we can multiply 2 times math.pi, or we could also write a function that converts degrees to radians if you prefer to work in degrees. Finally, the anti-clockwise argument determines which direction the stroke should be drawn about the radius, either clockwise being false and anti-clockwise, or counterclockwise, being true. Now, it doesn't matter which way we stroke for a full circle. When we define our start and end angles, zero is going to be in the positive x direction relative to the origin, or to the right of our origin. Now, this is probably what you're used to from school. However, as the angles increase towards the positive, they circle around clockwise, so that 90 degrees, or half pi radians, is actually below the origin, not above. Now this can be confusing at first, but remember the origin for our canvas is at the top left, and the positive y axis goes downward, contrary to most graph paper assignments taught in school. So 90 degrees is still y positive compared to the origin, but since the y axis is inverted compared to what we are used to, y positive is now below the origin, not above. We can stroke a quarter rotation by setting the start to zero and the end to 0 0.5 pi, and setting anti-clockwise false. Notice how the fill closes from the start of the curve to the end of the curve. We could draw three quarters of a rotation by going from the same start and end, but going anti-clockwise. If we wanted to have our shape actually look like slices of pi, we could move to the center of our circle before calling arc. Then we could call close path after our arc. This will create implied lines from the center to the arc and then back again. If you mess with the start and end angles and colors, you might find a familiar figure. Try combining lines, rectangles, and arcs to see what cool scenes you can come up with. Post them in the comments at doctype.tv slash mockups. Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it, but where are you gonna go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctype.tv from? So, we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you gonna use? Enter the code DOCTYPE3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply see site for details get your piece of the internet at godaddy.com that's it for this week and remember there will not be an episode of doctype next week but we'll see you when we come back in september 
Until then, be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype TV on Twitter. And if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of Doctype, or you want to send us your feedback on how to make Doctype awesomer, be sure to send us an email at questions at doctype.tv. And if you subscribe via iTunes or RSS, you'll never miss an episode of Doctype, and you won't miss us when we come back. So come on, why not? So until next time, remember that every great webpage starts with Doctype.